Hello everybody, welcome. My name is Paul and uh, welcome to the latest spring stargazing from your window. Uh, today we're going to be looking at something very exciting that you can see in the spring sky. Uh, might have mentioned it already. My name is Paul. I am the assistant planetarium producer for We The Curious. And before we go any further, we had a bit of a technical problem. There was a bit of stopping and starting. So I've actually started a couple of minutes later than I usually would. And we're a bit further up the We The Curious page than my original post. So if you can, let me know. If you've managed to connect to us in the comments, that would be absolutely fantastic. And it's always great to hear from you as well. So uh, hopefully, yes, I haven't lost all my viewers with my technical problem. Uh, so let's uh, talk about what we're going to be doing today, or indeed what we do here most days. Well, last week, last Tuesday and Thursday, we broadcast the first to spring stargazing from your window and we had a look at where to start looking in the nighttime sky so I showed you the saucepan the plow and I showed you the north star and I showed you uh, Ursa Major the great bear and Ursa Minor the little bear and we looked a little bit at the mythology behind that so uh, do let me know in the comments if you manage to find the North Star, if you manage to find Ursa Major or the Sospen in the nighttime sky, I'd love to hear from you if you have seen these things. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at a planet. And it's a planet that you may have already noticed in the nighttime sky because it is incredibly bright. Um, before we go any further, though, let me just have a quick look at those comments, see if we've got anyone tuning in. Oh, yes. Steve Deer, Catherine Wilkinson, Maria Cricket, absolutely fantastic. Hello, Thomas, Josh, and Miles. Brilliant. I'm glad I haven't lost everybody then. That's always good to know. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking for a planet, and we're going to be using, as we did last week, Stellarium to find it. And uh, Stellarium is a bit of free software that you can get from Stellarium.org. It's absolutely free, and it puts a planetarium on your computer. And I'm going to be using it to show you uh, this planet that you can find in the nighttime sky. Now, uh, I'm going to be using a lot of um, keyboard shortcuts, and what I'll do is try and read out the keyboard shortcuts as I use them, so you've got some idea of how I'm using Stellarium, and maybe you can try it again yourself. So let's go over to Stellarium, and we've got a beautiful daytime sky on Stellarium. Da, da, da. So I think we should go to the night time, I think that'll be best, don't you? So it's seven minutes past 11 in the morning. Let's go forward in time. Till about oh, half past nine, I'll say. Sounds good to me. Lovely, half past nine. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna turn around until we see something really, really bright. And I think it's in the west. I'm looking towards the east. That's no good. Turn right around to the north. Keep going. Aha! Now we've got a few bright things in the west. This is the moon. So it's not that we're looking for. Now this is a star called Procyon. That's part of a constellation called uh, Canis Minor, the little dog. Oh. And we've got Beetlejuice here. That's a very, uh, very excitingly named star. It's part of Orion the Hunter. And over here we've got Capella. But really, one of, what we want to be looking at is this here, the brightest object here, apart from the moon, planet Venus. Now, you've probably noticed, early evening, around this time, half nine, something really, really, really bright in the sky and uh, it is indeed a planet you are looking at planet venus now it's the third brightest object in the sky apart from the sun and the moon and there's a reason it's so bright and i'll be going into that a little bit later 
Now you might be wondering, why can't I see Venus all the time? Or why can't I see all the planets in the sky all the time? Well, there's a reason for this. It depends on where the planets are as they orbit the sun. Sometimes they're just not in the right place to be seen at night from Earth. Sometimes they're too close in our sky to the sun. But at certain times, we can see the closest planets to Earth. So sometimes we can see Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and of course, Venus. Venus is usually seen in the early evening or the early morning. So back in the day, it used to be called, uh, people used to call it the morning star or the evening star. But these days we know it's not a star, it's a planet. Now you might be wondering, what about those other planets? Well, there's Uranus. You'll need a telescope to find Uranus or a pair of small binoculars. Neptune, that's uh, even when it is visible in the sky. Well, it's not visible with the naked eye. You'll need a telescope for that as well. And what about dwarf planet Pluto? Well, that is so far away, you can't see it with small telescopes. You'll need a really, really big telescope for that. And even then, it's quite hard to see. So the further away the planets get, the harder they are to see. And you couldn't see them all the time anyway. Well, what are we going to do next? Well, what we're going to do is... Uh, well, I'm going to answer a very common question. How do I know I'm looking at a planet and not a star? Well, because you can see here, that just looks like a star there, doesn't it? Just like these two around it, just like Betelgeuse and Capella and Procyon. Well, you might have heard people say that stars twinkle and planets don't. Well, this isn't exactly true. I used to say that as well, but then I realized I'm not being entirely truthful there. Because uh, any light that comes from space, like the light from the stars, it gets interfered with by the blanket of air around our planet, our atmosphere and uh, the stars are so far away that they look like tiny little small points of light and this light as it passes through our atmosphere gets bounced around by our atmosphere it gets interfered with and we see this interference as twinkling now the planets are reflecting the light from the sun and they're reflecting that light towards us. And uh, the planets are a lot closer to us than the stars. So they appear as really small disks of light in the sky, rather than small points. And because of this, the light doesn't get interfered with quite as much. It doesn't get bounced around with quite as much by our atmosphere. So they do still twinkle. That interference is still there. But there's just not as much. So they don't twinkle quite as much as the stars do. So the way to tell you're looking at a planet rather than a star is that there won't be as much twinkling as the stars. Well, that said, let's travel to Venus now using Stellarium. So I'm going to move that to the center. I'm going to click on it, left click on Venus. And I'm going to press pick up or page up. And that should take us a bit closer. Look at that. There we go. Do, do, do. If I press spacebar, that'll center Venus for me. And then down here at the bottom, I'm going to press stop so I can stop it moving through the sky. And let's press pick up again. Get ourselves a bit closer. Oh, look at that. There we go, planet Venus. In all its glory. Now, you might be a little bit disappointed there. I mean, it's very beautiful. It's a planet. But uh, you might have noticed that we can't really see the surface. And the reason for this is that Venus is covered in thick clouds. Even if you had a telescope, you wouldn't be able to see the surface of Venus because of all these thick clouds that cover the whole planet. And this is one of the reasons that Venus is so very bright from Earth. Because lots of sunlight is reflecting off the tops of the clouds. Another reason that Venus is so bright is that sometimes it gets very, very close to Earth as it goes around the sun. Well, closer than the other planets anyway. Now, another reason, uh, <clears throat> we didn't know, you see, what was underneath those clouds for centuries. We used to look at Venus, and even when telescopes were invented, we didn't know what was underneath those clouds. Until, quite recently, until the 1970s. And in the 1970s, the Russians, the Soviet Union, 
started landing space probes on the surface. Now, before that, people had to use their imagination and use their imagination they did. Oh, yes, believe me. The first half of the 20th century is filled with science fiction books and films and comics all about people imagining what was underneath Venus. So just think about it. If someone told you that Earth had a neighbour, a neighbouring planet that was about the same size as Earth, a little bit closer to the sun than us, and it was covered in thick clouds and we didn't know what was underneath the clouds, what kind of things would you imagine were underneath those clouds? It really gets the old imagination going, doesn't it? So let me show you some of the things that people imagined. I'm going to press a few buttons here. And hopefully I can get you... Haha! -ha! Now this is a panel from a comic from the 1950s. And I found this comic on a site called uh, Comics comicbookplus.com and they've got loads of public domain comics these comics aren't owned by any companies anymore so people can share them on the internet and that's where I got this from this is a comic from the 1950s or a panel from a comic in the 1950s and it says if there are people living on Venus they must live in a lush tropical climate for Venus is 25 million miles nearer the sun than Earth is and that's what people thought they thought well it's closer to the sun than us so there must be like tropical rainforests, jungles underneath all that, uh, all those clouds. And they imagined all kinds of weird and wonderful plants underneath the clouds in those rainforests, like an octopus tree. So they imagine, imagine astronauts traveling to Venus through the clouds and fighting these weird and wonderful plants. Not just plants, they imagined aliens races of warriors who would uh, fight our heroic astronauts with these you can see some kind of giant worm there they imagined all kinds of fantastic creatures on the surface of venus so i mentioned in the 70s we started to get an idea of what was underneath those clouds that's when the russians actually started landing probes on venus and since that time, we've also been able to take pictures of the surface using radar. That's using radio waves to see what's underneath the clouds. And you can actually see a map of what's happening on Venus, what's underneath those clouds, from the comfort of your own home. Can you just imagine that, telling someone from the 1950s that, that from your armchair, you've got a little computer that you can have on your lap or on your table, and you can use it to see a map of Venus. It's amazing, really. Now, to find this map, you go to Google Maps. And you click on satellite. There should be a little thing in the corner where you can click on satellite. And that'll give you a satellite view of Earth. You zoom out as far as you can go. Right as far out as you can go. And then, on the left-hand side, it should give the option of exploring space. It'll give you the option of going to several planets and moons in our solar system. You could even visit the International Space Station. But what we're going to do is visit Venus. Look at that. So this is from Google Maps, a map of planet Venus created using radar. Now, when the Russians landed those probes in the 1970s, they found no jungles, no tropical rainforests, no life at all. And we can see it's, uh, it's quite barren, isn't it? Um, there's no life going on there at all. Now, the reason for this is that those thick clouds I mentioned act like a warm, woody coat around the planet. And they make the temperature so high on Venus. It's scorching hot. It gets up to, uh, well, more than 460 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than the inside of an oven. And not only that, but the atmosphere on Venus is so heavy. The atmosphere itself, if any astronauts tried to walk around on the surface, even if they could survive the heat, the atmosphere itself would squish them. Because the atmosphere itself is so heavy. Well, as you can imagine, these Russian probes that landed on the surface didn't last long before they were crushed and melted but they did manage to send back a lot of information before they were squished 
Now, I want to draw your attention to something on this map, and I would encourage you, use Google Maps to explore this yourself later on. But I'm just going to show you one of the, my favourite things on Venus. And there we go, I've circled it. it um, just in the corner there, it's Artemis Chasma. Now, Artemis Chasma, the reason I'm showing you this is because Venus is the only planet named after a woman. The only planet in our solar system that's been named after a woman. It was named after the Roman goddess of love, Venus. To the Greeks, she was Aphrodite, but to the Romans, she was Venus. And because of this, most of the features on the surface of Venus are also named after women. So these chasms, um, they're named after goddesses too. And you also get coronae. These are like circular features, circular ridges of rock, the coronae are called. And they're also named after goddesses. And you can see we've got Artemis Chasma and Artemis Corona in our circle. And Artemis was like the sort of the, um, the goddess of uh, goddess of wisdom, I believe. Or am I think I'm getting a mixed up with Athene there. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt, I believe, yes. And uh, let's zoom in a little bit closer because I want to show you what else people have named. You can see some craters there in Artemis Corona. And one's called Veronica and one's called Bonnevie. And that's because the craters are named after women as well on Venus. Uh, they've just been given girls' names like Veronica and Bonnevie. Now, if we head back out to look at that map again. Oh, by the way, just to explain what the Artemis Chasma is in a bit more detail, I'll head back to it there. There we go. Um, it's really interesting. Venus, like I mentioned earlier, is about the size of Earth. Now, the Artemis Chasma, that's that little circular crack you can see within my white circle there. That's about 2,100 kilometers from edge to edge. And you could fit most of Europe into that crack. So it's pretty big. Oh, yes. Anyway, I digress. Let me go back to this area here. You can see I've circled a different area. Phoebe Reggio. And the reason I've circled Phoebe Reggio is because I want to talk a little bit about these Russian space probes that landed on Venus. Now, uh, quite a few of them landed on Venus, and four of them in particular landed in this area, Phoebeo Reggio, because it's a nice flat area, and it gets a lot of sunlight. I say nice and flat. Flat compared to a lot of other places on uh, Venus. And um, they landed four of their landers, the Russians did, in Phoebeo Reggio. And there's one in particular, Venera 13 was the name of their lander, their probe. And the reason I'm singling out Venera 13 is because it lasted the longest. It lasted longer than any of the other probes. Um, they planned for it to last about 30 minutes. But it was actually sending back information to Earth for over two hours. This was in 1982, this was. year after I was born. And, uh, well, it's, it was the first lander on Venus to send back colour pictures. I think it was the only lander to send back colour pictures as far as I know. Let me show you one of those pictures. This is really exciting. Actual picture from the surface of Venus. Look at that. This is a real photograph taken by Venera 13 of the surface of Venus. And you can see those sharp teeth there in the corner. Uh, that at the right hand corner. That is the bottom of the lander. And you can see the rocky surface there of Venus. So imagine that. We've gone from no, what not knowing what was underneath those clouds. A hundred years ago, we had no idea what was underneath those clouds. Like 70 years ago, we were making stuff up. We were imagining what was underneath those clouds. And now, in 2020, we've got an actual photograph of what's underneath those clouds. So just imagine what we're going to find in the future. What else we're going to learn about Venus and about all these planets? Well, uh, I'm going to leave you to explore Google Maps yourself. Have a look at Venus yourself. See if you can find um, see if you can find other planets as well on Google Maps and other moons and have an explore of them. But for now, let's go back to Facebook.
We'll get my lovely face back up. Hello. Let's go back to Facebook and see if we've got any questions. So, do, 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 do. Marvellous. Um, oh, Amy is watching. Uh, Amelie is watching. Jessica is watching. Sarah, hello. Hello, Jessica. Someone comparing me to post-lockdown Rufus Hand. I'm better looking than Rufus Hand, I think. Oh, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. Let's have a look. Hello from... Hello, Jack and Scarlet. Hello, Emma. Hello from Jonty. Now, I wonder, does anybody have any questions? I tell you what, while we're waiting, let me explain something else that uh, I find quite interesting. Uh, in fact, let's go back to Stellarium to do it. If I click on Stellarium there... Oh, there we go. And I'm going to press page down. Oh. I beg your pardon. Du, 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 du. There we go. We go back to Stellarium. I'm going to press page down. And zoom out so we got a nice view of the nighttime sky again. There we go. Fantastic. And I want to show you what happens if you press comma. If you press comma in Stellarium, look at that. You get a line. And this line across the sky, this is the ecliptic. And when the planets are visible, they'll always be roughly along this line and so will the moon so you can see Venus is there not far off that line and the moon's there not far off the line and the Sun will also be somewhere along that line too and this is because all the planets are going around the Sun including Earth they're all going around the Sun on a sort of flat plane and people find that quite interesting I find that quite interesting that it just so happens that they've all managed to fit along this flat plane going around the Sun and the reason for that is because our solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago from a big cloud of dust and gas in space. And that cloud was spinning. And that spin caused the cloud to flatten into a disk shape. Now the sun and the eight planets formed out of this disk of gas and dust and material. And this is why today... Those planets orbit in a sort of flattish plane. Not quite completely flat, not quite level with each other, but pretty close to this flattish plane around the sun. And this is why, when you look at the nighttime sky, all the planets will always appear somewhere around this line going through the sky, this imaginary line, the ecliptic. So I wonder if we've got any more questions. Let's head back now to Facebook. Do, 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 do. Is there an online user manual for Stellarium, Steve has asked. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a really good question. When you download St Stellarium, if you right click on the shortcut on the desktop and you say open file location, that will take you to the little folder where all the Stellarium stuff is kept on your computer. And you will be able to find a little folder called Guide. And inside that, there is a massive user guide to Stellarium. It'll take you quite a while to explore that. I'm still exploring it myself. I haven't figured out anything else myself. Right. So, um, do, 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 do. why does Venus have clouds around it, Charlotte Matthews has asked. That's a really good question. I don't know, they're all um, poisonous clouds they are. We wouldn't be able to breathe them. But uh, I guess it's just when the planet formed, the right gases and the right material sort of formed together to create these clouds. Maybe uh, I'll look into that question in a bit more detail for you and see if I can give you a bit more of a detailed answer in the comments after the show. Lydia has asked, are there any more plans for missions to Venus? Not that I know of, off the top of my head. I think uh, Mars is where everyone's focusing their attention these days. But maybe there is something planned. I, again, I'll look into that for you and see if I can answer that for you in the comments. Miles has asked, are there any fossils on planet Venus? That's a really good question. Well, we don't know, you see. Uh, we don't know if there are any fossils to, to find sort of fossils. Maybe um, well, they would have had to have been like life on Venus a very, very long time ago. And uh, I, maybe uh, further back in time, 
um, Venus was a little bit different to as it to what it was now. Maybe it was uh, had more of a breathable atmosphere. Maybe there was uh, life around that time, but we don't know for sure. And uh, even if there are fossils to find, like dinosaur fossils or something, well, you would have to. Uh, it'd be very difficult to dig them up, wouldn't it? But if we are thinking of life on Venus, the most likely place scientists think to find life on Venus is going to be in the clouds. Because higher up um, in the clouds, um, there's less pressure and it's less hot. So maybe there's sort of floating microbes, tiny, tiny, tiny little germy organisms floating around in the clouds up there. We haven't found them yet, but you never know. Maybe we'll find them one day. So let's have a look. Have we got how did they get the probe to Venus? Samuel has asked. Well, with great difficulty. Um, they just had to send it up in a rocket and they had to send it up at just the right time and in just the right place and I mentioned earlier on that these landers that they sent up um, had to go in this um, flat plane where it got quite a lot of sunlight and of course it's really difficult to find a good spot for um, all of the to, to get your lander to land on Venus because um, it's not as if you can look at it in tremendous detail even with radar and so um, it, it's very, very difficult to send a lander to Venus. And as I said, most of them, uh, well, they all didn't last for very long before they were squished and melted by the atmosphere. And of course, also, some of them crashed as well. Some of them did crash and uh, didn't land properly and didn't work. So as the answer to your question, how did they send probes to Venus? With great difficulty. Well, it's gone past half past 11 now. We had a bit of a late start, but I think I'm going to wrap it up there for now. What I will say, though, is that do have a look for Venus in the night sky because it's always really, really exciting. Uh, whenever I find it, I always get very, very excited. So do have a look for Venus in the nighttime sky. It should be visible for the next few months in the early evening sky. And, um, yeah, have a go on Google Maps. See if you can find Venus. See if you can go to one of these other planets. I'm going to keep uh, answering questions in the next couple of hours in the comments. And, of course, there's going to be some blogs to accompany this as well. So that's something to look out for on the We The Curious page. I'm going to write some blogs to sum up what we looked at last week and also to sum up what we're looking at this week as well. So, uh, well, I hopefully we'll see you on Thursday now, same time, 11 o'clock. Hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties this time. And uh, we'll, maybe we'll look at a few more planets on Thursday. How about that? Well, I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you very much.